Good morning. Thank you so much for joining us. In so many ways, it's hard to believe that we're already on the last of our series on the cross for our times, a cross in our context. After Easter, we go back to our regular scheduled midweek devotions, and of course, we're approaching Holy Week. I've so enjoyed being with you in the last few weeks and look forward to moving forward in the future. You know, there's no doubt that we live in confusing times. If your life's at all like mine, then you're inundated with large amounts of information and opinions. And most of the time, they're fleeting at best. One day it's this, and then the next it's that. There's constant anecdotal stories of friends of friends who experience points to a truth, only to be countered by another anecdotal experience that points in the exact opposite way. Given that, I wonder how many times in my life I confuse my own or somebody else's strong opinions for truth. How many times do we hear half-truth, run with it, make a few assumptions, and then come to a somewhat faulty conclusion? If you think about it, can you imagine the stories that were whirling around concerning Jesus on the night that he was betrayed and arrested? Jesus, he must run around with a bunch of violent thugs. In fact, I even saw one of them attack a poor guy named Malchus and cut off his ear. I mean, sure, Jesus healed him, but then he uttered threats about calling down 144,000 angels to do whatever he wanted. I guess some of that's completely true, and some of it's only half true. Peter, a friend of Jesus, did draw a sword and cut off Malchus' ears. But Jesus, in fact, did heal Malchus. Jesus also did talk of 144,000 angels at his disposal, but it was in the context of showing Peter that his violent actions were useless. This is how the gospel writer Matthew records it. Then the men stepped forward, seized Jesus, and arrested him. With that, one of Jesus' companions reached for his sword, drew it out, and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Put your sword back in its place, Jesus said to him, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Do you think I cannot call on my father, and he will at once put at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen this way? Jesus, he could have called more than twelve legions of angels, more than 144,000 of them to do what he wanted. But instead he chose you and me and all of humanity. And he laid aside such power to go peacefully to a mock trial, to go to a court where he knew he would be found guilty of made up charges. So he was taken to be questioned and sentenced, first to the high priest and the Sanhedrin, then to Pontius Pilate. And as we witness this, it's such an interesting exchange between the two of them, between Pilate and Jesus. If you want, you can read more about it in John chapter 18. But here's the thing. Pilate is confused and impacted by their conversation. So much so that several times he tries to release Jesus. And each time the crowds would have nothing to do with it. Near the end of their conversation, Pilate throws his hands up. Truth? What is truth? Sarcastic and frustrated by the situation? Or intrigued and seeking because of the interaction? Perplexed, maybe, by the wisdom and honesty? What was it? Maybe it was all three. It's an in interesting query. What is truth? Is truth something that's subjective? That means, does it change based on my experience and opinions? Or is truth objective, meaning it exists beyond my own experiences? Or is it even possible that truth is not just a thing, but instead a person? The enemy of truth is always the deceiver. We see this played time and time again in human history. To Adam and Eve, the words of the deceiver come. Did God really say, no, you won't die? You'll just be like God. 
It's just a simple invitation to replace God with self, to think that we're the ultimate authority in everything. And then the deceiver comes to Jesus. Three half-truths to get him to lose focus, to elevate himself above everything, and to forget the will of the Father and to forget why he was sent. And to us, what are the half-truths that we tend to believe? What are the volatile, volatile things that we seem to be drawn to take hold of? Why is it so easy to be divided and to turn on God and on one another? What are the things that tempt us to think higher of ourselves than we ought? Hard things to contemplate, but as we contemplate those things, know this for certain. It is in each and every situation that we face that the truth link, rings loud and clear. Jesus is the truth, and he has chosen to be part of your life. He has chosen you above all of the imperfection, the confusion, and the chaosness of life. Here's the invitation that he gives us to believe. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, you know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Jesus, the one who is the way, made his way to the cross, and he broke out of the empty tomb. Jesus, the one who is the truth, invites us to not fear and to cast every burden, everything on him. Jesus, the one who is life, has given everything so that you and I might have that life, both here and now and also eternally in heaven, with him and with all who would believe. You are a redeemed, loved, and cherished child of God. There's no deceit, no rumor, no half-truth, no wrong that has ever been committed or uttered by you or towards you that can stand in the face of the truth that you are loved and forgiven by the one who has the power to do so. The one who is truth embodied is with you now and always, you are loved by Jesus. This is true in his name and for his sake. Amen. Would you please join me as we pray? Father in heaven, we thank you so much. We thank you for showing us the journey that you took to the cross in Jesus. We thank you for the life that was won. We thank you, Lord, that Jesus rose triumphant. We pray that you would take all of the malice and the hurt and the pain of our hearts and you would transform that into something good. Lord, enable us to live and to love as you live and love in and through us now and always. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you so much for joining me. Wow, you're probably wondering what's happening uh, this Holy Week. And there's so much happening here at Bethel that I had to write it down. So here it goes. On Monday, Thursday, we have an in-person service at 7. And we also have an online devotion that will go live in the morning. On Good Friday, we have in-person services at 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. And both are going to be live streamed. On Easter Sunday, we're going to three services, 8.30, 9.45, and 11 o'clock. The 11 o'clock service will be live streamed. And then the week following Holy Week, we go back to our schedule of two services at 8.30 and 10.30. We look forward to seeing you in the coming future.